Thank you very much, Mr. Hughes. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, Honorable Minister, CEO, panelists, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I wanted to start by with a caveat, a kind of disclaimer that I'm not an economist. <laughs> and therefore what I what I'm about to say must be understood in a, the context of trying to be commonsensical. That is not to say that there is not common sense in economics, neither Am I trying to create a division um, between the two? But I think that it is important that I lay my claim, having failed the level economics twice <laughs> and having had to switch to other areas of A level. So <clears throat> um, the, the, there's no contradiction, there's no mutual exclusion between common sense and economics. But I just want to state my claim um, as a non-economic ec economist in, in addressing this economic issue. But I want to start <coughs> in looking at the, the, the budget announcement and its impact primarily on labor and the working population. I want to look at it, I want to locate it in a kind of broader macroeconomic policy framework and to see what the implications are, both immediate and in the medium term. And since I've eight minutes, I'm going to kind of be jumping, Mr. Yeah. Hughes. <clears throat> so first of all, we understand Jamaica's economic problems, high debt, high unemployment, low growth, low productivity. Since about the 1990s, what we have seen is the adoption of a development policy paradigm that has sort of fit into a contemporary global ideology, which we call neoliberalism. And for the last three years, under an IMF agreement, we've been able to pursue those with the primary objective of tackling poverty, reducing poverty, that is, creating jobs, reducing the public debt, and advancing public sector efficiency. <laughs> the ultimate objective of the IMF agreement, I must remind you, increased growth improved productivity, low unemployment, higher per capita GDP. So what we are to do is to assess over the three years, and I know Damon is going to tell me to be patient, but over the three years, whether we, the trajectory of the economic outcome is moving us in a direction of achieving those strategic objectives. And I don't have time to get into all of that today, <clears throat> but that is something that we need to do. But the second important thing is that we place an emphasis, and quite rightly so, on growth. But we too often for years, and it's not only a problem here in Jamaica, it's a problem in Latin America, which they have recognized and attempt to correct, that there's this dichotomy between economic growth and social equity. So what we have done <coughs> is that we make much of the growth of the 1960s. Started in the 1950s under Norman Manley, proceeded in the 1960s, and understandably not in, a, in an economy that has just got independence with all those opportunities, the growth was almost a given. But what we fail to balance that with is the fact that unemployment doubled, poverty doubled, the social gaps widened, and those are factors which we too often don't give a pride of place and primacy of place in terms of understanding the economics at hand. So what was important for me was that the minister attempted to frame his budget presentation within the context of productivity improvement, economic growth, and job creation. And quite rightly linked the tax reform to these objectives. But from a worker's perspective, while that is good, the question is, is it sufficient? What we have seen and we have heard 
certainly both from the World Bank and the IMF, is that the Jamaican economy is beginning, the reform program is beginning to bear fruit. That the reform measures have improved the environment for the private sector and have started to restore confidence. That we have moved up in terms of doing business ranking and that our NIR has moved up and that our GDP per capita has fallen. <clears throat> Even although our nominal debt is rising, we're still borrowing. We expect that, certainly by the World Bank's own forecast, to see accelerated growth of some in the region of 1.2 to 2% over the next two to three years. But when we look at all of that, the social equation, the social issues, which are an important part of not growth, but importantly development and prosperity, that they are not at all convincing in terms of the direction in which they are moving. A 2011 IMF report, for example, said that poverty, unemployment, and inequality in Jamaica rank among the worst in the Americas. We have the second highest unemployment rate, and at that time it was 11.8%. The fourth highest poverty rate, and the second worst among 23 countries in terms of an equal distribution of income. So that when we examine the Jamaican economy, on the one hand, and we commend and accept the need that those social indicators need to be moving in the right direction. But equally importantly, the question of social equity, the social well-being of the Jamaican people must be taken into account in order to create that balance. And it is what the IMF program has prescribed as its primary objectives. So that Latin America and the Caribbean, for example, speak of the need to take into account people's perception of economic growth and development. 68% of the Jamaican people canvassed last year says that, in August last year, says that the economy is moving in the wrong direction. That is not something that one can ignore. The unemployment rate now stands at roughly about 13.5%. Real wages have declined over the last eight years. Poverty rate is in excess of 20%. But nevertheless, the economy is said to be doing well. So when we look at the tax measure, for example, this 1.5, that, that 1.5 has, the demand quite rightly said, had to be obtained through taxes. Hmm? And so we have a tax package that is $1.275 billion in excess of the fallout from the income tax relief. The purpose of the income tax relief is to provide more disposable income to stimulate economic activity for growth and investment. No investors, is, no investors are going to come to Jamaica if there's no demand. If that aggregate demand is not improving and increasing, then there's no need to invest. So that $1.275 billion or thereabout, it would seem to me would be prudent to include that in the wage package of public sector workers so that it provides more disposable income consistent with the objective of the tax relief. But that, of course, will not happen. Because the, because the, the ideology, the neoliberal ideology, does not place sufficient equal prominence and emphasis on the social side of development as it places on the economic indicators. So what we end up with is 
a taxation that is on, on gas that is going to have a multiply effect. We don't know what the end result of that is going to be, but if you get you know, total 1.5 million relief on one hand, what is going to be the cost to you in terms of the multiplier ripple effect of the taxes on gas and the, the um, liquefied petroleum, which no, also has an implica implications on our electricity bill. We don't know. That needs to be worked out. But the second thing is that we can't look at it only in terms of this fiscal year because already we know that the total fallout in revenue as a result of the tax measure is somewhere in the region of $30 billion. And we have a tax package of $12.75 billion. And therefore, come April 1, 2017, the government has to find an additional roughly $18 billion. Where will that be coming from? And who will be responsible for footing that bill in the context, very important context, of what the IMF says about shared sacrifice? Are we seeing that shared sacrifice evident in the tax package now? And what can we look forward in terms of shared sacrifice in the tax package next year?